Today's uh, subject is a fancy way of talking about light speech, as per the Noble Eightfold Path. And uh, I, I chose this subject because I think when we are trying to live a virtuous life, it's often uh, easy enough to restrain ourselves at the physical level sometimes. And at the mental level, it's not very visible. You know, we can have sort of thoughts about people, but they won't necessarily know what we're thinking, and we can sort of work on that in private. But with speech, it, it's a little bit more tricky because the words come out of our mouths very quickly, but we can never really put them back in once they've left. And uh, so much harm is therefore caused you know, through careless or unreflective speech. And of course, the opposite side of that is that speech has huge potential for bringing people together, for uniting people, for you know, starting a revolution of peace and happiness or... Extinction Rebellion, or whatever it has to be, you know. And so how do we use our speech in a way that's really constructive and helps our own spiritual growth and also, you know, the prosperity and peace of society? Like, is it important to always sort of say what people find agreeable or, you know, what is true no matter what? Or is there sort of a balance in that in some way? And also, how does that pertain to the whole path, you know, as a whole? So the Buddha talked about right speech as being the second factor of the noble... Sorry, the third factor, I think it is, of the noble path. And that's immediately preceded by right intention. So the three right intentions are intentions of uh, renunciation, which is a bit of a loaded word in, uh, in this culture, but it basically means um, a non-grasping. It's the opposite of, uh, of desire, of craving, of clinging. So you can also see it as a kind of um, a non-control, say. You know, often we use speech in a way that wants to control others <laughs> or get a certain response, desired outcome from others. And so this is the opposite. It's a sort of letting go. And then the other right intention is an intention of loving kindness. And the third one is the intention of non-harming, or you could say in the positive aspect that would mean compassion. So these three intentions guide and inform the way we use our speech. And they, in a way, constitute the roots of speech. So if you're coming from a place of metta and kindness, then your speech is very likely to be beneficial to others. Not always, but it's much more likely to be. Whereas if it's coming from the roots of aversion, then you know, even if you're trying to say something kind, it won't quite fit. It won't come across in that way. You know, It could be veiled with sort of anger and... Yeah, there can be something underneath it, which, or sarcasm, for example. You know, you try to say something nice, but there's a bit of a, a dig in there. So, um, and, and of course, from right intention, we're going into the right speech, right action, right livelihood, which all constitute part of the training in virtue. Which also has a bit of a bad rap, I think, in the West, because it tends to imply a kind of constraint or some sort of restriction or obligation, you know, whereas actually virtue can be seen as a very positive and active practice. So as part of the gradual training, which the Buddha talks about throughout the suttas in about 40 places, the uh, virtue aspect is the place where we start to develop happiness. And the first uh, benefit of that is non-remorse. So, you know, you don't go to bed thinking, gosh, what have I done today? I really shouldn't have done that. Or, you know, I haven't quite told the truth to somebody. They're going to find me out tomorrow, you know, <laughs> which is obviously a cause for regret. And um, there's other suttas in the text which talk about a causal sequence that begins with the practice of virtue. And it says that one with virtue need not um, exert a volition, may I be free from remorse, because it's natural that if you live a virtuous life, you'll be free from remorse. And from there, it leads into happiness. Right? One with non-remorse doesn't have to exert a volition. May I feel joy? Because it's quite natural, if you reflect on it, you know, that you're living a wholesome and beautiful life that benefits <coughs> others, that you will feel joy. But sometimes we don't notice that joy because it's quite subtle. And also because we're not well-practiced in these sealers. We might think it's enough to abstain from unwholesome speech, but are we actually actively practicing expressing gratitude, expressing appreciation to others, maybe even sometimes the more difficult tasks of pointing out where somebody maybe, you know, you feel they do need a bit of feedback and you really are trying to give this out of benefit for that person even though it's difficult, you know. That takes certain courage and quite a lot of discernment and um, self-observation, you know, because sometimes we think we're doing it for the other's benefit but it's actually because we'd like to 
tweak them a bit for our own <laughs> benefit, you know. So we have to be quite careful about that. And um, so these are sort of ways that we can use our speech to create a harmonious society and to kind of catalyze also positive change, positive action in society. And in the suttas it says, you know, that um, one of the principles of living in harmony is to have um, thought, speech, and um, mental conduct of loving kindness, both in public and in private. And I like this because this is starting to show, you know, that it's only to our benefit if we can live a life which is congruent. Right? So we don't say one thing to some and then go back and think something else in, in private. And also the idea that in private we can cultivate positive thinking, positive thought, positive speech also. You know, if I'm speaking to one friend, I can speak about another person to her in a positive way or a negative way. And then when I see that other person, that will definitely affect how I feel around them. If I've been speaking about them slightly negatively, I might feel a little bit you know, uneasy or guilty or you know, not quite uh, congruent you know, with my conduct in private. So this is where we start to bring the practice into every aspect of our life and uh, our mind. And of course, you know, whatever we cultivate mentally tends to come out in the form of words and speech. And in one sutta, the Buddha says, um, whatever you frequently ponder and reflect upon becomes the inclination of your mind. So that means if you're thinking in a certain direction, you know, always for finding fault or seeing what's wrong, that actually starts to become the way your mind naturally gravitates. You cultivate that. And I think, unfortunately, for people brought up in Western education systems, that's considered quite a good thing. You know, we call it critical thinking. (laughs) Critical. (laughs) You're kind of looking for how to improve, what's wrong, how to tweak it, how to make it better, rather than sometimes focusing on what's already working, you know. Because sometimes we have strengths that are really quite beautiful, but they're kind of clouded by all the things we find wrong in ourselves, and we spend so much time trying to fix that in ourselves and in others, that we forget to kind of uh, build on on the positive qualities. So this fault-finding mind is a a really difficult uh, aspect of our psyche, I think. And uh, I think Hajar Brown, what was his quote? Complaining is finding fault, wisdom is finding solutions. Which I think is really lovely. And in my experience with him, when I work quite closely to build this monastery... He tends to allow me to say, you know, where I'm upset or what's troubling me, but he never really kind of feeds it. He he just sort of lets me say it and then lets it go. And he usually thinks about it, you know, between one phone call and the next and then comes forward with some sort of action plan or some kind of something I can do to make me feel empowered or, you know, to change the situation, basically. So... um, yeah, so I wanted to get on a little bit into um, how the Buddha describes right speech and also in its positive aspects because it's worded very beautifully. And so I took a little photo of one of the suttas that I love. It's the Majjhima Nikaya number 51. And this is one place where the positive aspects of virtue are discussed in quite a lot of depth. So the first one, abandoning false speech... She abstains from false speech. She speaks truth, adheres to truth, is trustworthy and reliable, one who is no deceiver of the world. So this is really beautiful, and I think truthfulness is probably the most important aspect of right speech because we're trying to discover truth. You know, when it says adheres to truth, I think of this as a kind of commitment, you know, to understanding the reality as it is and not deviating from that by arguing against it, you know. It's like this, but I don't really want it to be like that. Or, you know, for example, somebody might ask you in the morning, how are you? And you think, well, I better say I'm okay because it will make them feel bad if I don't. So it's like, yeah, I'm not bad, okay, yeah. Rather than actually expressing how you feel, you know, because it takes courage to do that and and maybe we're afraid of hurting the other. But I think truth is also about learning to show up as we are And being authentic in this world, you know, and kind of honoring the way we feel, honoring our feelings and being able to, like, look another person in the eye and and tell them how we feel. And that takes trust and courage, but it also gives the other person permission to do the same, which I think is really important. And so there's a certain sense of vulnerability in that. And the Buddha doesn't only say, you know, speak the truth. He also (coughs) says in other places that, you know, it should be true, that's always, you know, the first criteria, but also 
it should be said at the right time. So that can mean like not when a person is feeling tired or grumpy or maybe not in public so that you're going to embarrass someone in terms of giving feedback or whatever. And, uh, and also that it should be delivered gently, right? not harshly. So it's the delivery is very important. There's some occasions where he said it's okay to speak in a little bit of a sharp way as long as you're absolutely sure this is true and beneficial. But even then, he says, you have to do it considering the right time. So I really think one of those things is to talk with somebody when they're feeling resourced, you know, and even ask them, like, is it okay for me to just have a word with you about something at the moment that's disturbing me, you know, and not making it about them, but making it about you, you know, you're struggling perhaps with something and just learning to put it in a way that is non-accusatory, yeah, (coughs) judgmental. And then, uh, yeah, so the feedback should be true, it should be gentle, it should be at the right time, and it also should be motivated by metta, right? So when we speak falsely, often that's motivated by a kind of fear or greed, perhaps, you know, or we're just too lazy to sort of tell the whole truth, yeah. We sort of think it will save time to just skirt around it. Um, but actually it ends up getting you into much more trouble. <laughs> you end up getting into kind of, you know, a whole web of lies. Apparently with a lie detector test, they've actually, uh, the reason they work is because the, uh, the whole system starts to react when you tell a lie. Like the heartbeat speeds up, the blood pressure increases, and, uh, you know, you might start to sweat, so the body temperature increases. And they can detect lies quite skillfully using these devices. And also the activity in the brain is apparently a lot more complex when you tell a lie than when you don't. So it kind of shows that we're primed to tell the truth. You know, it's easier, it's simpler, it's less of a difficult cognitive process to do that. Um, And I think, you know, it's kind of part and parcel of the path. But yeah, knowing the right time and doing so with metta. And the other thing, and I mean, sometimes we think something's the truth, but it's not really the truth. You know, it's just our opinion. So I think this is also quite good, especially on social media. You know, people are always... I read something today on social media which shocked me. It was from a Thai lady, I think. And, um, and there was a post about a man who's openly gay. And I think he, um, he is a makeup artist some of the time and also a monk some of the time. I don't know if this is two different periods of his life or what. But um, it was very nice. And he was talking about being real, being authentic, being who you are, you know, and not being afraid of that. And... And that, in a sense, the two things are not so dissimilar. It's about um, being the best you can be, you know, trying to honour who you are and bring that out into the world in a way that benefits others. And uh, and then this comment was written there that oh no, gay gay people can't ordain, you know, and even if they did, their preceptor would be making a mistake and they'd be, you know, committing an offence basically by ordaining them. And it sounded so authoritative, and that was what sort of disturbed me, because often these things are said with carelessness or with a lack of knowledge and stated as facts, when in fact they are opinions and, you know, can be fueled by a lot of prejudice, you know, personal prejudice. So we have to be so, so careful with this on social media. And because I'd seen it, I felt like I had to respond. (laughs) If I hadn't read it, you know, I didn't need to. But, yeah, sometimes uh, there's a lot of myths going around, which are quite, quite dangerous. (coughs) So truth is very important. And then the next one is malicious speech. So that's the next one to abandon. So here it says, abandoning malicious speech, she abstains from malicious speech, does not repeat elsewhere what she's heard here in order to divide those people from these, nor does she repeat to these people what she's heard elsewhere in order to divide these people from those. (laughs) Which happens quite a lot, I think. (laughs) So the colorary of that is that one is a promoter of friendship, enjoys concord, rejoices in concord, delights in concord, a speaker of words that promote concord. So this again is very beautiful and I think one of the most important things about monastic life is to develop harmonious communities because in a harmonious community you feel safe, you feel like you're not going to be attacked or picked up all the time on what you're doing wrong, you know. And so you're giving a gift to another person of safety and ease. And harmony is a kind of prerequisite, really, for going deeper in the practice. You know, if you come into a room and you don't feel safe, it's very difficult to relax fully. Whereas when we do feel safe, we can almost just sort of disappear. 
I often found in my own monastery, you know, it was when I was feeling really at ease that I felt I could now, and, and, get, and having good relationships, they weren't necessarily an end in themselves. Because I had those good relationships, I felt, okay, I can let the monastery go, I can go back to my heart, and I can meditate, because I know that things are okay. You know, people are dwelling in concord, and it's very beautiful, and I would often reflect on that, you know, before starting my meditation, and get a lot of joy from that, thinking that we were all contributing in that way. Same at the little monastery here, I was saying today, you know, I was being cooked for by these two lovely ladies, one who came all the way from Hawaii, <laughs> for about a month to look after me and um, and you know it's not just food that I receive it's all that beautiful intention too the kindness and the thoughtfulness that's gone into it and just you know just doing it out of love and it's very beautiful I'm sure even if the ingredients weren't very particularly special it would still taste delicious because you've got that meta ingredient it always tastes better right on retreat or <laughs> so. so the next one is abandoning harsh speech so this correlates, of course, with speaking gently. Abandoning harsh speech will have a he abstains from harsh speech. It's hard to say. He speaks such words as are gentle, pleasing to the ear, and lovable, as go to the heart, are courteous, desired by many, and agreeable to many. So not like Donald Trump. (laughs) Mind you, his words are agreeable to many, but um, I personally don't relate to that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So this is just showing some of the potential for speech to actually uplift, yeah, and to open the heart. So we can actually use it. I mean, silence isn't always the best. Sometimes we actually need to hear something. You know, maybe you've had the experience of sort of telling somebody something that's been quite difficult and sometimes it's really nice just to feel that that person holds space and, you know, responds in a warm way and doesn't kind of jump in and fix you, but sometimes you just want to hear I hear that, and I hear that's really hard. And it can be such a felt sense of relief when somebody, you know, responds in a way that causes you to relax and feel loved and feel accepted. Mm. So the next one is about (coughs) gossip. And the gossip is not uh, quite so negative. The root of it isn't quite so negative. The other ones are mostly, like, have the root of aversion, so the motivation of aversion or... Or desire, but the gossip is more like a motivation of like it's more like delusion, not really understanding kind of what you're doing, maybe getting distracted or wanting to just divert yourself from how you feel at the moment. You know, sometimes you start off speaking about subjects that feel quite relevant, and after a while, it's like you're just talking for the sake of talking because you've got into the habit, you know, or you kind of trying to distract yourself from work that you need to do or whatever it is. So it can kind of start to. Um, My teacher always says, the longer you speak, the more it kind of degrades. (laughs) I think that's true even in the monks' monasteries. And, you know, I don't know about the nuns' monasteries, but certainly in the monks' monasteries, I think it gets into a lot of banter. (laughs) Of course, they say the same about the nuns, but I think it works both ways. (laughs) So abandoning gossip, one abstains from gossip, speaks at the right time again. What is fact? Speaks on what is good. Speaks on the Dhamma and the discipline. And at the right time, speech speaks such words as are worth recording, reasonable, moderate, and beneficial. Yeah. So we all know how it feels when somebody goes on and on and on, and you're starting to think, hmm. I mean, for me also, sometimes I speak to people about things because I feel like if someone asks me a question, I like to give a lot of information to kind of fully answer them. And then after a while I think, oh, did I give too much information there, you know, because you need to feel really safe with a person and they're not going to kind of later misuse that against you, you know, or use it in a way that does divide you from others. So we need to feel that we can trust the people who we confide in. So, but at the same time, there's another really nice passage that I think is worth pointing out because he's not only saying that you always need to say pleasant and agreeable things. There's also a place in the suttas which says that um, without, yeah, that it's basically you're causing harm and maybe possible long-term consequences, bad consequences, if you praise people when they deserve dispraise or if you dispraise people or blame people when they deserve praise. Right? And rather, he says, we should praise that which is praiseworthy, blame that which is blameworthy, and after investigating and scrutinizing. 
So this is like pointing to really having sharp powers of discernment and not putting down those critical faculties. You know, sometimes there are situations where somebody's out of line and, and it's better to actually say, I think this person... I mean, you don't need to make it personal. You can say, I think what this person is doing, right? So you talk about the action, not the person. I think what this person is doing is destructive. It could lead to a lot of um, difficulties in the future. It could cause, you know, a lot of racist attacks. You know, you can see this happening in politics all over the place. And it's not necessarily good to always look for the for the positive side of that person. Sometimes it's important to dispraise what's worthy of dispraise. And the other one is um, believing matters meriting suspicion. This is kind of the textual language that they use. So, you know, something is actually suspicious, but you try to believe it because you just don't want to see that, you know. And again, this is kind of... I think it's a, a motivation of delusion, actually, not wanting to fully investigate, yeah, or being suspicious of a matter that merits faith. I thought about lawyers with that because that's quite a tricky business. I don't know if there are any lawyers here, but you know, it must be quite hard if you've got a case and it's like your instinct is that actually maybe you're standing up for the wrong person, but you kind of have to do that even though it merits suspicion. You know, you're trying to find all the arguments for it. So I think you know this is really tricky, and I don't envy lawyers. <laughs> but then also just about silence and about inner speech because I think this is you know moving more deeply into the practice um, sometimes there's a space to say nothing and people like I said don't want fixing you know they just need to feel heard and sometimes less is more Ajahn Brahm always says you know unless you can improve on the silence it's better to not speak or something like that don't speak unless you can improve on the silence which I think is really lovely I mean it doesn't mean it literally but uh, certainly in meditation, I think that can be true. You know, we often break into speech, and sometimes at the most inappropriate times, just as things are getting quiet, it's like, hey, what's going on here? You know, should this be happening? What do I do now? That's a common one. Like, what do I do next? You know, and you're moving into the future. But uh, in the uh, suttas as well, there are lots of places where it talks about um, overcoming unwholesome inner speech. So the first one is sort of seeing whether this is for your benefit or not, whether it leads to enlightenment or not, or whether it's leading to your harm. So that's what we sort of reflected on a little bit in the meditation. And the Buddha says that when he realized that certain thoughts led to his harm, it was enough for them to just subside. You know, just seeing that this is actually dangerous and it's not going in the right direction helped him to abandon those thoughts. But then when he saw thoughts based on loving kindness and compassion and renunciation, he said, there's no harm in thinking those thoughts, except that eventually the mind will be tired and the body will get tired. And at that point, he learned to just quieten the mind down. But I think it's a really positive message, you know, that we can actually look at our thinking and notice, okay, some thoughts lead to harm, some thoughts don't lead to, uh, lead to non-harm and lead to our benefit and lead towards the goal. And realizing that we have a choice, you know, we're not just subject to our thoughts, we're not just victim to that. There's a way that we can cultivate. And he does say, you know, by repeatedly reflecting in certain ways, you start to incline in that direction. Not only does it become the way your mind inclines, it becomes your character. You know, people who practice a lot of metta, if you have thoughts of loving kindness, it's really hard for negative thoughts to get in, or they start to surface less. You know, or maybe moments where you say trip yourself up or do something a bit clumsy, you realise, oh, actually, I didn't beat myself up at that moment. There was a kind thought of, oh, you little, oh, silly you, you know, something much gentler and softer. And so, um, in one of the suttas, the Buddha talks about five ways for overcoming thoughts, and the first one is substitution. So this is where you notice that a thought is actually harmful, and you realise, okay, I can replace it, directly replace it. So say if you're having an angry thought about somebody, you can look at the positive side of that person and think, I don't need to focus on that right now. May they be happy. May they be well. You know, or if they really do a lot of harm and it's difficult to feel those things, you can at least feel like, may they not suffer. You know, or else, okay, they suffer for their karma. I wish them well and just let go. Just let go of that thought because it's not doing you any good. So this is the substitution, and of course you can substitute thinking with your meditation object in general, whether it's the breath or the body sensations, you know, the more fully you're able to arrive in that kind of non-discursive experience, 
the more the thoughts fall away because the present moment starts to open up the body, the sensations start to open up you see more and more deeply into it and there's less to say I think the Mahasi method sometimes um, uses a noting just as a way it's not actually supposed to take you away from the experience sometimes it does but it's meant to be like just a little sign that points you more deeply to what you're experiencing so that you can drop more discursive, complicated thinking and just come back to the main experience you know, and from there go more deeply into the subtleties of those experiences. So that's the substitution. And he said it's like, um, it's like you've got a, a coarse peg. So if you imagine something held together by like a wooden peg, I guess they were in the Buddha's day, and you knock it out with a finer peg. So it's still a thought, but it's less coarse, less um, disturbing to the mind. And then the next way to do it is to understand the danger in that way of thinking. So we talked about that a bit already, you know, that you realise this isn't leading anywhere. You know, if it's not leading to your harm, at least it's wasting your time. So, so you sort of stop thinking by realising that, yeah, this is uh, getting nowhere. I can't get to the truth through thought. Truth is something beyond thought, you know, that has to be directly experienced. And the thinking is just old stuff. It's what you've learned. It's what people have told you. You know, sometimes it's just like the echoes of what you've talked about in the day or music. Like for the first two years, I think, of my practice, I used to just have song after song after song going through my head because I was so obsessed with music. And they were the worst. They were the things that I never listened to even. But they were all in there. And it made me realize I have to be so careful what I put in my mind because it all comes back out when I sit on my cushion. <laughs> it's the same with social media, you know. You go into that and you kind of numb out or blank out and... It's like the mind becomes so dull, but then later on you'll sit to meditate and this silly sort of irrelevant article will come to your mind or an image that you've seen will come to your mind. So it's like with these precepts of non-sort of monastics, we're not supposed to go to shows or concerts and stuff. It's not like a value judgment that these things are wrong and bad. And I know monastics who listen to music in private, you know, from time to time. But for me, if I put music in my head, because I'm very musical, it just comes back. It goes round and round and round. And so I just realized, actually, it's much nicer just to have a quiet mind and not to kind of constantly overlay, you know, the, the natural quiet with stuff. And I think as contentment deepens, you don't need that so much, you know, because often it's just uh, not wanting to be with what's manifesting. We break into thought or we add distraction on distraction. So, yeah, that's the second one is the danger. And then the next one is interesting because it's noticing the thought formation so I think this is kind of like catching the thought before it becomes fully manifest. <clears throat> so sometimes when you're sitting, you can sort of feel something wanting to bubble and there's a kind of feeling tone to it or there's a sort of a, a sense that this is a sort of desire arising or a sort of <clears throat> arising and then it breaks into a thought and sometimes you can catch that before it fully forms. So it's kind of like seeing where these things come from, like what is it that causes you to break into thinking. One little method which... Um, is quite useful, I find quite useful in my practice, is if I am thinking quite a bit, is to ask myself, what's my next thought going to be? And I just sit there like... And it's like, if you ask yourself that, what's my next thought going to be? You're really like waiting. There's this <coughs> sense of listening quite deeply, really listening in and waiting. It's kind of like the mouse, or whatever, the cat waiting for the mouse to come out. It's like... They're really poised and alert. In this case, we're not waiting for that because we're not going to like kill the thought or anything. You know, we're just going to recognise it, and that should be enough. But I think that's quite a helpful one if your mind's just racing. You know, actually take an interest rather than ah, I don't want this. Ah, it's like lean in, lean in, and listen a little bit deeper. So, and and then the next one is ignoring the thought which sounds a bit like pushing it away, but it doesn't really mean that. It, it more means like not paying it too much attention, like not making a big deal. Sometimes if you practice a kind of open awareness style of meditation, you know, you allow whatever comes to come. You don't kind of give it particular special attention, you know. The thoughts are a problem when you drag them right into the front of your mind and you kind of go over and over them. But if you just allow them to kind of stay in the mind but sort of on the edge, not really in the centre... And in the centre, you can put something else, like you could put silence. So, yeah, you have the thought, but there's some silence in there, and you notice that. It's not like you're pushing the thought away, you're just not on the alert for it, you're on the alert for something else. Yeah. Or you just put the attitude of kindness in the middle of the 
screen of the mind. That's my favourite, you know. Just constantly focus on, like, how am I relating to my experience? And then it doesn't really matter what comes up because it's met in that kindness. And things usually either stay or they don't. It's up to them. But you don't make a big deal. It's the non-owning, non-ownership. It's a problem when it's my thought and I don't want this thought. But when it's not my thought, you can just let it be there and it doesn't have to cause too much trouble. So I quite like that one. That one's quite helpful, not giving it too much attention. And then the last one, which people sometimes quote, actually, is um, using force. And the nice thing about this sutta is that it makes it clear that it's a sequential thing. So in the first case, where it's substitution, it says, if this doesn't work, then try the next one. If that doesn't work, then try the next. So it's going through all of these methods until you get to the absolute limit of kind of, I guess it's driving you mad at this point. And the Buddha says, you know, then you can use force and crush mind with mind, which sounds really violent. But I think this pertains to, like, when the thought is so strong and so negative that you could actually break into an unwholesome physical action. And at that time, you know, it's good to just basically stop that thought or, you know, might divert it, have a drink of water, just do something else, you know. Go and see somebody. Go and see a counsellor, maybe, if your thoughts are driving you mad, you know. You're basically trying to stop anything that could lead to harm. Yeah. So that's a kind of little overview of um, wise thinking and I guess how it can lead to less thinking as well. Like how focusing on intentions really determines the kind of speech which is likely to come out of your mouth and also the inner speech, you know, and just noticing that speech and thinking has roots. It comes either from greed or from wanting or aversion or delusion, right? So we're trying to get smart about this and wise about this and uh, learning to use speech in ways that can really bring a lot of healing to ourselves and others and also in the practice because uh, I think, you know, it, it can be quite easy to talk to others fairly kindly but how do we talk to ourselves when we close our eyes? I mean... Just the other day I went to bed really late and I woke up in the morning thinking, oh no, you really shouldn't have done that. How could I do that? How could I do that? You know? And then I realised, wow, actually I haven't spoken to myself like that for a while and it stuck, it stood out you know, that I was speaking to myself in quite a berating way and I did feel instantly more upset. <laughs> it's like, okay, so you went to bed a bit late but that's okay because you can learn from that. So I tried to sort of remind myself there was a different way to speak to myself, you know, because at that moment I, fo- I forgot. And it is painful. And one of the things, one of the quotes I really love, or stories that I read that I really love, um, was from a, a prisoner in death row. And they were on death row for something like 15 to 20 <coughs> years before they were finally acquitted. So they were actually innocent. And, um, and this person was released from jail, and uh, he was asked, you know, in an interview, like, You know, you say you don't have any anger or resentment to the people who imprisoned you. How is that? You know, you've been inside for so many years, you've lost the best years of your life. How did you cope with that experience? And he said, oh, I learned to speak kindly to myself. (laughs) And that was how he coped, which I think is so beautiful. So we have this capacity to learn to speak much more kindly to ourselves, the way perhaps we would to a child or to someone who we can have a lot of empathy with and I think it's really important to develop that empathy towards ourselves and learn to speak in much kinder, gentler and softer ways. So, uh, so yeah, so that's a little uh, bit on speech and how speech can lead towards peace and I'd like to open it up now for any uh, comments or feedback, questions. Complaints. Even complaints are okay, right? They're part of right speech. <laughs>